good evening, everyone. Glad to have you with us today. Thank you for joining in on our online uh, evening Bible study for this week. Today is the 29th of April, 2020. And again, I know I've already said this before, said it this morning, so not another video, but I'd like to wish my mother a very happy birthday today on the 29th of April. What a blessing it is. It's an honor to be here this evening. And uh, we'll get into our Bible study here in just a moment. Uh, for those of you who may be wondering, what is this, if you see this wire and this uh little black ball back here i got a new microphone I'm going to try out tonight and see how well it works out so we'll be recording on my computer for the audio version that goes on to sermon audio on our website and uh, other platforms and uh, so just want to remind, remind everyone we have our virtual fellowship this friday again we'll be playing boulder dash one with another we're doing that on zoom and we're looking forward to being together one with another uh, this coming friday that'll be a blessing so make sure if you will uh, get in touch with me give me your information and uh, so we're doing Friday. Actually, we're doing Friday afternoon. We're doing 2.30. That's right. Yeah, we decided that yesterday. And I, I forgot to send the message out on WhatsApp. And uh, so, unfortunately, I think, Brother Preston, you're just hearing that for the first time, aren't you? I'm sorry about that. And uh, so, yeah, so that way more people can be involved. And so I will send a message out um, uh, tomorrow morning to remind everyone. So we'll be joining together at 2.30 on Friday afternoon. Uh, for our virtual fellowship with the church. Looking forward to that, having some time together. All right, guys, we're in the last couple of days of April. And uh, if you remember, in the month of May, we do what's called a 1021 prayer challenge. Uh, we have these cards that are printed up. I know that we're not together as far as physically right now. Uh, we'll try to get these cards as a reminder to you. Uh, Brother Preston will take some today to his family. I'll take it to my family. But the challenge is this, the 1021 uh, challenge is for, to challenge you to pray 10 minutes a day for 21 days in a row uh, for the church. Just pray for church growth, for financial uh, blessings, for families, for unity, for protection, and most importantly, for souls. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So for 10 uh, minutes a day for 21 days, we challenge you to pray for the local church. That's what we're praying for. That is the, the specificity of this particular prayer challenge is for the local church we're getting ready to hopefully within a month's time come out of this lockdown and uh, so we'd like to see a mighty and wonderful blessing from that so you say why 1021 1021 is the code for a fire in the United States now I understand I wanted to try to uh, use one that was here for Britain I talked to a few, a few firefighter friends of mine and asked them and I just could not get the code that worked with uh, the numbers that we needed so 1021 10 minutes a day and then we want to see a fire ignited within the local church a revival to come through our community this will be the third month of may that we've done this so i ask you guys if you will um, you know if you still have your card from last year or the year before uh, put that up on your mirror on your fridge on wherever it may be that you'll see it every day as a reminder to pray for 10 minutes for 21 days in a row beginning on 1 may beginning this friday to pray for the local church, praying for Sarah Chapel, praying for Sarah uh, South Baptist Church, for growth, for financial blessings, protection, and most importantly, for souls, that we could increase our footprint in our community to make a wonderful difference. So guys, uh, I do want, want to thank you for being here with us here tonight. And uh, again, let me remind you, any prayer requests that you have, please get them into us so that we can uh, be steadfast and praying one for another. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to get started. I'm going to start our recording here now. So if you will, guys, uh, let's take our Bibles out. Uh, let's take our Bibles out, if you will, and we're going to be in uh, the book of Acts to start out with here this evening. Now, we're getting back into our Bible study uh, in the book of Acts titled The Spread of Christianity. And this is kind of a, um, um, how would I put it? This is kind of a superficial approach of our teaching on the life of Paul in years past. We're hitting the high points as we note the spread of Christianity. Now there's a point or two that I'm going to cover today that may be a little bit lower in depth uh, concerning Paul's life. And it may you know, delve back into where we were a few years back in Paul's life. But it's all for a particular purpose. And that particular purpose is to reveal and to bring to light the spread of Christianity throughout the world that started uh, with this wonderful man that God chose. Uh, the Apostle Paul. And uh, so we'll get into our lesson here in just a minute. We're going to start roughly about Acts chapter 8. Now listen, I'm not going to have you read every single verse uh, tonight because I do have a, this point, number one, I want to go over rather quickly uh, and get into a, 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 the area of Paul's life where we'll settle down in Acts chapter 9. All right, so let's ask the Lord's blessing upon our Bible study tonight and then we'll get started. Father in heaven, 
We thank you, dear Lord, for what you've done for us, for who and what you are. We thank you for a wonderful Bible study yesterday on Tuesday, uh, dear God, uh, via Zoom. We thank you for that as the church came together and uh, we had a Q&A session. What a blessing that is. So, Lord, I love you and I thank you for who and what you are, for all that you've done, your many wonderful gifts. And I ask you, Lord God, to set that fire inside of our heart. As we begin this prayer challenge on Friday for 21 days, praying 10 minutes a day for the local, local New Testament church, I pray that you would ignite that fire, dear God, right here in our village, right here throughout our valleys. Lord, we look for revival. But Lord, we look for souls to be saved and born again. Revival is just to bring back to life that which is, uh, was alive at one time. But Father, we are looking today uh, for new souls to be saved, to be touched, to be tender, their hearts be melted and convicted by the preaching and teaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we ask of you, Lord, to please pour the Holy Spirit throughout our valley, Lord. Let us see a wonderful difference made. Increase our footprint, I pray, uh, within South Wales so we may have a great and wonderful effect upon the people, dear God, that you uh, want to see saved and born again. Every soul, Lord God, we pray that the word of God would go out to, that you would convict them that a difference may be made in their life. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus Christ's glorious name. Amen and amen. So the first thing I want us to look at here this, this evening uh, is, again, we're looking at, at, at Paul's life. Yes, we're looking at, at Saul. We're looking at what he was initially prior to becoming a saved, born again individual, prior to being that apostle that was chosen out of due time. And so point number one to tonight is the cruelty of Saul. I want you to see the cruelty of Saul. You say, well, that touches on a little bit of the point that we uh, ended with last week, and yes, it does. But the cruelty of Saul, I want to draw a grave contrast between what Saul was and what Saul became, therefore bringing the spread of Christianity throughout the world. So in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. He made havoc of the church. Now, guys, this is the only time uh, that this word ever appears in the Bible. The word havoc is defined as waste, devastation, uh, wide and general destruction is what it's defined as. This is what Paul had done to the church. That's what it says. Uh, as for Saul, he made havoc uh, of the church. Now, by the way, and Acts chapter 8, guys, in this point here that, that Paul is uh, uh, bringing devastation upon, upon the, uh, the land, bringing devastation upon uh, the church. Now, when it says church, it means saved, born again, uh, individual. That's what it's talking about in Acts chapter 8, verse 3. Uh, he wasn't, you know, there's really no point. I'm not, I don't want to bang a drum right there, but, uh, but these are Jewish people that were saved uh, up until this point here in Acts chapter uh, 8, verse 3. Uh, we find that, uh, uh, that, that uh, there, there wasn't a Gentile saved as of yet. Uh, first Gentile gets saved in Acts chapter 8, which is the Ethiopian eunuch. We find later on in the chapter, the second Gentile that we know about that's recorded in salvation is Acts chapter 10. Uh, then after that, and the reason I say that is that, that Saul is such a main, main uh, part of Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter uh, 7, and then obviously Acts chapter 9, when we, we'll look at here in just a moment. But he's such a great part here, and it shows the contrast in verse 3 about havoc. It's a beastly term, the word havoc. All of Greek literature, havoc is associated with describing beastly events. He was acting and functioning as an animal, animalistic terms. The reason the Lord, I believe, is recording this for our knowledge, and then we see that first Gentile saved, that Ethiopian eunuch, within the same chapter, is because of this havoc that Paul was raising in the church, that he was uh, attacking the church. Because of that, they were finally scattered throughout, and the gospel began to go to uh, Judea, and Samaria, all right? Yet the uttermost parts of the world, except we understand that uh, that eunuch would have taken the gospel back to Ethiopia. Uh, we do understand that clearly. God was preparing a man here for a day, for an hour, for a moment uh, to bring that gospel to uh, the, the world, the spread of Christianity. So it's a beastly term, and we see the Lord using beastly terms concerning uh, Saul and the way that he's living in here in, in, uh, in several verses. If you look in Acts chapter 9 in verse 5, and uh, when the Lord is convicting him, and we talked about this last week uh, in relation to Stephen's sermon, that the word sermon means to stab. And, and the Lord said, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And again, that's another beastly term. Uh, it's a beastly description. That long rod that we spoke about last week uh, with some type of point on the end, a blade or a stone or something along that line. And that it would make the oxen go and stop and turn and things like that. It's a beastly term. 
Acts chapter 9 and verse 13, uh, Saul's cruelty is characterized by what it says. He did evil to the saints. He did evil to the saints. Uh, when you look back in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3 again, uh, it says there, And entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. I mean, Saul would come into their, their little prayer meetings and their little homes and their devotions and drag these men and women out, drag, drag these husbands and wives out. He would drag these mothers and fathers out in front of their children. Uh, the utter cruelty. I want you to notice that there's no mention of children being hauled away. So can you imagine the screams of the children as their parents were violently taken out of the house all because now they're praying in the name of Jesus Christ? And guys, we complain because we sit on a hard pew. We complain in our life because, uh, uh, you know, maybe the, the church is too cold, too hot, too damp, too wet, too dry, whatever. And yet we find these guys are meeting and praying in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, here comes Saul. And his cruelty is, is emphasized so greatly that they dragged him out, that they were dragging these people out. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to give you a handful of verses here as we can kind of wind down on this point here this morning. But Acts chapter 22 and verse 5 uh, says to bring them, Paul is testifying, to bring them which were there bound back to Jerusalem for to be punished. Guys, the Puritans wrote that the reason women are mentioned three times, uh, that it's a clearly stated the madness and the cruelty of Saul, that, that Paul mentions them in his testimony three separate times because it was just given evidence of Paul's madness, Paul's cruelty or Saul's cruelty, if you will against the church prior to him being saved. He says he brought him back for one purpose, and that was to be punished. Right. He punished, man. Acts twenty two nineteen, 19, Paul says, I imprisoned and beaten in every synagogue, them that believed on thee. Acts 26, 10, I gave my voice against them, Saul says. Acts 26, 11, he made them blaspheme. He forced them by any means necessary. To blaspheme the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 9, 1, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. This is the, this, this is the epitome of the cruelty of Saul. And from this vantage point, uh, I mean, who, think about it just for a second here. Because we're going to get into this uh, under uh, the point number two. But uh, almost as a segue thought here. From this vantage point, looking at the... Uh, at, at the descriptions that we've thus seen on the cruelty of Saul, who do you believe could write better about the love of God greater than the Apostle Paul? I mean, Paul referred to himself as being the chiefest sinners, and we can understand why as we begin to read his history prior to salvation. But we can have a greater appreciation of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, when Paul writes, But God, who is rich in mercy... For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in, in sins and hath quickened us together in Christ, by grace you're saved. Who can write better that verse right there from a man who went from hauling men and women into prison, who carried them back to be punished, who imprisoned them in every synagogue. He gave them voice against them, made them blaspheme, breathing out threatening and slaughter, raising havoc in the church, all the while kicking against the pricks of that sermon that Stephen had preached the whole time. Who better could, could preach? about God's rich mercy. Who better could preach on forgiveness? Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through uh, his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who better could preach on mercy? Uh, Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Who better could preach on the long suffering of God? 1 Timothy 1.16, how be it for this cause? I obtain mercy, Paul says. That in me, first, Jesus Christ may show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them uh, which should hereafter believe on him uh, to life everlasting. Who better could talk about forgetting the past as Paul emphasizes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth those things which are before. Who better? When you begin to look at the description of the cruelty of Saul, to teach and preach and write on those things, forgiveness, mercy, long-suffering, and that of forgetting the past. And then the Apostle Paul. So how does he go from being this person who's breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the Lord, who's the disciples of the Lord? Who better uh, uh, than, than, than this person that they can, can preach uh, um, on, on just the mercy of God in the midst of this madness and this cruelty? 
have the Apostle Paul. Right. So what made the difference? What made the difference is the conversion of Saul. So now we're going to go to Acts chapter 9. And we want to settle there just for a little bit. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, as a matter of fact, it's a remarkable chapter. It's one that can be illustrated uh, in the lives of all who are saved and uh, live a devoted life to Christ. Paul is converted on the road to Damascus uh, roughly three years after Calvary. And so briefly, what I want to do is as we begin to evaluate the conversion of Paul, I want us to notice the great change. We saw the cruelty of Saul, but, but I want us to see the great change which occurred in his life. The first thing that we see, uh, uh, see is a, 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 was a change of who and what dictated Paul's life. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't him any longer. It wasn't the law of the letter. It wasn't a. Uh, it wasn't the council. It wasn't emotions or feelings. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lord controlled Paul's thought, life, but most importantly, the Lord controlled now Paul's thoughts. And when the Lord controlled Paul's thoughts, he therefore dictated Paul's actions. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven three, uh, but I would have would, would have you know that every uh, that the head of every man is Christ. Paul makes that very clear. So examining Paul's life before and after salvation in the midst of this conversion, uh, it's easy to notice that who took control, that who took the helm, and, and who controlled his thoughts and their, thus his actions. Notice that we find in Acts chapter 9 and verse 2 that, that Paul's put in his, his hands on them. In Acts chapter 9 verse 2, and, and desired of him letters to Damascus and uh, to, to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound. Uh, so now he's he, now what he's doing, he's putting his hands on them. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 17, he's laying his hands on them. A grave difference, if you will. One is putting his hands on them out of aggression, and now he's laying his hand, hands on, uh, he's having hands laid on him out of love and compassion. Look at Paul's conversation. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, we see him breathing out threatenings and slaughter. But yet in Acts chapter 9, verse 11, we see that he prayeth. Now Paul prayeth. Look at his members. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. He's against the disciples. Uh, he's an enemy of the church. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 17, now he's called brother. Now he's called brother. Look at his attitude. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. He's against the Lord. But in verse 20, he's preaching Christ. His actions are very clear. Again, Acts 9, verse 5, Paul's kicking. He's kicking against the bricks. Verses Acts 9, verse 20, he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 9, 2, he's callous, wanting others to suffer. Acts chapter 9, verse 16, he's caring and willing to suffer for them. Acts chapter 9, 1, he's contentious and filled with hatred. Acts chapter 9, 17, he was content, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's his actions. What are the conditions? Well, in verse 8, he's blind. Verse 17, he has sight. What about his company and those that he ran around with? Acts chapter 9, verse 7, there was men that journeyed with him of the same, of the same demeanor, yet in Acts chapter 9, 19, he traveled with the disciple. Guys, when you begin to outline Acts chapter 9, it reveals that the life of Paul and, and the church would, would, would follow for the rest of their existence. So Acts 9 actually, actually reveals what not only Paul's life, but the local church uh, would begin to follow for, for the rest of his existence. And I would, would say that, that as a rule, it's following, it's following this same thing uh, even yet today. We see the condemnation in verses 1 through 3. This is the outline, if you will. So there's a condemnation that you find uh, of the church and of the people, even by the people who are lost, uh, the enemies of the cause of Christ in verses 1 through 3. But then in verse 4, we find conviction. Now, those of you that are listening and, and saved, born again in the blood of Christ, you know exactly where I'm coming from from this point. You understand clearly that there was a time, there was a point in your life uh, when you may have not necessarily been against the church, but uh, you know, you, maybe you would condemn Christ, maybe you'd use the name of Jesus in vain, uh, that you never read your Bible, that you took everything for granted that God had given you, and, and yet there was conviction at one time by the Holy Ghost that you're in need of a Savior. We went over this yesterday in Bible study. It was at this point where the Lord Jesus Christ brought conviction to the heart and the mind and the soul of Saul. What he was doing, who he was, and where he would go. So from the condemnation of the church to the conviction by the Holy Spirit of God, now we find verses 5 and 6 
the conversion. Paul's conversion could not have occurred outside of the conviction of the Holy Ghost when the words of Christ were spoken in verse 4. It's within this, it's within verses 5 and 6 that the Apostle Paul says, Who art thou, Lord? Look at it with me, if you will. I know that we, uh, we're, we're, we're reading over some of these verses, but again, I told you it's a superficial cover of the spread of Christianity. So, Paul, again, I say this to you, Paul, uh, or Saul, I mean, same person, uh, could not have had a conversion. Paul's conversion could not have occurred outside of the conviction of the Holy Ghost when the words of Christ were spoken in verse 4. Right. The guys, that's a pattern, if you will. That's a pattern that is followed from this day forward. Salvation doesn't occur outside of the spoken words of Christ. Right. Faith cometh by hearing, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Not the word of man. Jesus Christ, we find here in verse 4, it says, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And from that point forward, the very next thing that we find within this conversion, just leading right up to the steps, was Paul asking, Who art thou, Lord? You know, some people will read this verse and they'll say that, I've heard men say that Paul was ignorant, that Paul was destitute. They've said that Paul was, uh, uh, was uh, sarcastic and arrogant. And every one of those guys are 100% are wrong. Paul, uh, guys, at this point is not questioning the existence of God. If anybody believed in the existence of God, it was Saul. Right. If anybody believed and knew the existence of God, it was Saul. He could run circles around us in the Old Testament at this point in time in his life. So he's not questioning the existence of God, but rather who God is specifically. And it's not an abnormal thing. Those of you out there that are listening, you're sitting here thinking, well, who gives him the right to question God? He's not questioning God. He's asking for a specific name. Who art thou, Lord? The name Lord, the word Lord means self-existing eternal one. It's the same Lord that you find in Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So that Lord is a self-existing eternal one. He's, he is confessing the self-existing eternal one, God. He wants to know who art thou, Lord, because the conviction is set in. It's not an abnormal thing. And mind you guys, it's not an abnormal question to ask especially during a dispensational change within the scriptures. How, does, how do I mean that? Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is thy name? What shall I say unto them? That's what Moses asked. Nothing wrong with that. Moses believed in God. Moses wasn't questioning the existence of God. Moses wasn't questioning the, uh, he wasn't questioning any of those things. All he was simply doing that day was saying, well, what's your name? And we know the rest of the, we know the answer. The Lord said back unto him, I am that I am hath sent thee. Here's the, here's the fun thing about that. Paul is weighing in the balance just as Moses was. And when he says, who art thou, Lord, that same Lord, self is this the eternal one. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew, in, in Psalm 23, who art thou, Lord, capital L, small cap, O-R-D, comes from the Hebrew word Yahweh, where we get the name Jehovah. And when you go back to Exodus chapter 3, I am that I am, is translated from the root derivative Hebrew words, Yahweh, that you get Yahweh to Jehovah. That's who it is. Moses had a right to ask that question. Wasn't con he wasn't condemning God. He wasn't questioning the Lord. He wasn't, he wasn't doing anything to that manner. He simply was asking a question. Who art thou, Lord? And Paul is doing the same thing. As a matter of fact, he's confessing the, the eternal existence of the Lord. He's confessing the eternal existence of God. But he wanted a name. A specific name. He's weighing in the balance the worth of the name of God. Conviction had already set in from the preaching of Stephen. Now, six days later, with the sermon stabbing him in the heart, resulting in him kicking against the pricks, he meets the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Conviction comes in. And in verse 5, Paul is counting the cause. Um, this is the who aspect, if you will, of conviction. He's weighing the worth by utilizing the title and name of God, Lord. And in verse 6, a confession is made. 
The fact that Jesus Christ is Lord, the self-existing eternal one, he's agreeing with God that Jesus Christ, he's agreeing with Christ that he is God. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. There's nothing, there was nothing that, that Paul left was left to ask. What would thou have me to do? That's it. From that point forward, Paul was clear. He knew what he had to do. This is the conversion of Saul. And, and there's nothing left but, okay, now what do I do? What do you want me to do? Paul wasn't looking back. Paul wasn't trying to correct anything. Paul was simply asking now, what would you have me to do now? Taking the very next steps. So evidences of Paul's conversion is seen uh, in the great effect and change that it had in Paul's life. And we see this throughout the spread of Christianity. What happened on the road to Damascus that day carried on uh, and is still continuing to carry on this very day. We see this change happen in Paul's language. In Paul's language. Paul's language uh, uh, before he had met Jesus was rough. It was, it, it was, it was you know, uh, it, it, was, it was strong. It was harsh. It was, it was here it was. And, uh, you know, you never understood what may, what was going to happen. But now, after he met uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, after the, this conversion, uh, Paul knows someone that lives in heaven. Listen, Paul's language began to change. Uh, you know, Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. That's the way it is. The language, his language changed. His way of speaking changed. Paul's letters, you know, when... Paul's letters that before he met Jesus or, or when he, after he met Jesus, uh, there was something special about his letters that he would write. As a matter of fact, uh, I consider letters uh, to be a bit divine, especially we know these are. I mean, I think God can, uh, thinks of letters being divine. He's given us 66 letters here, confined in a book, preserved and purified. Amen. But a letter is a common place that two people can meet who are far apart. Paul's letters changed. His language changed. Paul's labor changed. Paul's labor uh, uh, before and after he met Jesus Christ, it changed. And uh, there's, there's a strange portion, there's a strange portion of scripture I want you to see here real quickly. And I'm monitoring my time. I'm going to finish up here in just a few minutes and I'll be done. So if you look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to double check this while we are doing that. First Corinthians 15 is where we're going to be. Go, just to make sure that was still going on. First Corinthians 15, look at verses 9 through 11. What you see, we're talking about labor here. Verses 9 through 11. The Bible says there, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. He says, For I am the least of the apostles, and I uh, and that am not meet, and then am not meet uh, to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labor more abundantly than they all, uh, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Therefore, which, uh, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Now, Paul labored more abundantly than they all, he says clearly. And yet he accredits the grace and faith for the, all of his labor's endeavors. And it's true that grace and faith must be exercised. Matter of fact, Matthew Henry said that when God gives great grace, he, he exercises it with great trials. So Paul makes a, 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 a statement here that I labored more than them all, but he never took the credit for his work or his labor. He says, I labored more than them all, but it's the grace of God that is with me. He, he Again, he credits his labor without a grace and faith. Our faith must be tried and our trials must be through works. It doesn't always have to be through tribulations. Guys, if you want your faith to get stronger, if you want your body to get stronger, you got to increase the weight uh, when you're working out and you're getting strong. It's the same thing with our faith. You've got to increase your, your labor, increase your workload so that faith will be exercised through God's grace. Paul's love changed. Paul loved sinners, guys. Uh, even in the state that, uh, guys, I, I remember even in the state that Paul, you know, I remember my own life, I'll say, even in my state prior to salvation, you know, God loved me. Paul takes on that, that persona, if you will. He loves sinners. He didn't love the sin that they were committing. He didn't love the sin that they were stuck in. I'm not saying that uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, he, he loves sinners because he knows God was uh, reconciling the world back into them. First Timothy chapter one and verse 15 um, tells us clearly, but this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul says, of whom I am chief. This changed Paul's life forever, the conversion did. Many times it is the voice of one person that will make the greatest difference in another person's life. The voice of one person. And Paul took that on personally. He took that on board to a point where he wanted to change every person's life that he came into contact with. Right. I'll give you a handful of verses here. If you can turn there. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. If you can get there quick, guys. Uh, my time is just about drawing to a close. And I, I want to make sure that we, are, uh, we stick to that tonight. But Paul loves sinners. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, he says, But as touch and brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Paul not only loves sinners, guys, but he loves saints. If you look in Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, he says, For their hearts might be uh, comforted, being knit together in love, for unto all riches, uh, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father uh, and of Christ. He loved sinners. He loved saints. He loved the Savior. He loved the Savior. He wanted, again, he wanted the saint's heart to be knit together. He wanted the, saint, the sinner's souls to be saved, but he wanted them to be saved by the Savior that he loved so much. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians in chapter 1. And look uh, toward the end of the chapter, verse 21. He says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, that is uh, the fruit of my labor, yet what, what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. You can see here that he, his, his love for the saints is, is put him in a strait betwixt two because his love for the Savior. And I believe in all of my heart, not only we see him. I, I understand it's only mention of the Savior and saints as far as his love goes, but I believe that, that he understood also that his love for sinners to see them become saints put him in that strait between two. Paul's salvation had a long lasting deep effect on the churches as well as every single believer that, that seeks to please God and to serve him yeah. sacrificially. I want to close with this last sub point here of uh, the evidence of Paul's conversion and the things that it changed. I, I, I'll, I'll read it to you again. It changed his language in the way that he spoke. Uh, he spoke a heavenly language now. Uh, you know, uh, it changed his letters. He wrote a, a divine letter. It changed his labor, his love. And love it, it changed his life. And it changed his life as well as every single life that would come after them, those that want to love uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and live righteously. Paul's life after meeting Jesus, his salvation changed. It not only changed his life, but it changed the life of those that were around him. I mean, one cannot study uh, correctly the conversion of Paul without also looking at, a, at a, little, a, a little known man who was intricately used in the salvation of Paul. As a matter of fact, almost immediately. Turn back to Acts chapter 9, guys, and this will be the last time I ask you to turn tonight. We'll be finished after this. Again, I say this, that Paul's life changed dramatically. It changed for the rest of his life. Not only his, it changed those lives that were around him. But there's one particular person that I, I'm really drawn to uh, in the conversion of Saul, that Saul's conversion itself, not only was he used in Saul's conversion or in the midst of it, but it changed his life, it had an effect on him in ways that would never, ever, ever be repeated. <clears throat> Acts chapter 9 and verse 10 and this is what we find here. And you know the story. I mean, Paul's, uh, uh, in verse 9, he, he's three days without sight. Neither did he eat nor drink. He's fasting there. Uh, he's already saved by now. Again, transitional period of the church. But look at verse 10. It says, and, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into a street which is called Straight. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul. Of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that 
call on thy name. Verse 15 says, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Ananias is a prime example of the effect one person can have on another. Right. Now here's Ananias. It makes it clear in verse 10 that he is a disciple. He is, a, uh, he is saved. He is born again. He is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no question about that. However, there were prejudicial views that Ananias would possess. I don't know whether or not he uh, had any prejudicial views toward the Gentiles. There's no recording of that. Most of the Jews at the present time did, even Peter. But I do know this for a fact. There were prejudicial views toward this man named Saul. This one who we just see in a handful of verses before was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the Lord. This one who created havoc in the churches. This one who was hauling men and women uh, back, who, who were forcing them to blaspheme, who was given uh, consent for disciples to be killed, who named the name of Jesus Christ, who was committing guys uh, uh, mor moral crimes against human nature, humankind. And I says, Lord, <laughs> you know, this guy's come over here to destroy us. Yeah. You know, I've heard a lot about this guy and ain't none of it good. But on this particular day, every prejudicial view that Ananias possessed prior to this day, everything that he had prior to this day were now gone. They were washed away. They were removed from his heart and from his mind. I mean, the Lord is giving this man a job to do. Ananias I'm speaking of now. Which in all fairness, from his standpoint, and understandably so, he could or possibly would be killed by walking into that house, that house owned by Judas, where this man named Paul, or Saul, you know, was praying. I understand where Ananias is coming from, and I trust that you do as well. But I want you to understand where the Lord is coming from and giving us this record. He reveals... What difference one man's life can make into another's. Mm -hmm. So the spread of Christianity, guys, no, it didn't start out in a whirlwind. The church went through trials upon trials upon trials. And a matter of fact, the church at Jerusalem was growing in such a leaps and bounds that I'm probably what fueled Saul to, to, to breathe out threatenings and slaughter and to, to create havoc in the churches. Yet every time they would kill one, cause one to blaspheme, haul one up, 10, 15, 20 would pop up somewhere else. The Lord used Saul. He called him a, a man of God. He called him as an apostle. He called him to be the minister unto the Gentiles, of which Paul said, I magnify mine office. So I'm here to tell you today, guys, under the conversion. We haven't finished the conversion of Saul. We'll get to it next week. But I believe we see the evident, the evidence, I should say, of the difference that one person can make in another person's life. All because he was willing to be used of God. He was willing to give his life over to the Lord and serve him faithfully. Yeah. I trust this was a blessing to you today. I hope that it encourages you and helps you. And uh, again, we just ask you, we ask you to just study it. Study out these scriptures, apply them into your own life as best that you can. Let's bow our heads and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing of this evening. We thank you for the word that you've given us. We thank you for the preserved record that you have given us perfectly and the holy scriptures that we may be able to look at the difference that was made in the life of Paul and the life of others. And we ask that you please would lead God, direct each and every one of us into the right way. And we'll give you honor, glory, and praise in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, I hope and pray that God has blessed you richly with the preaching and teaching of his word tonight. And I uh, do want to thank you guys for joining us here this evening. And uh, just as a, a quick reminder, as I said in the beginning, I uh, just want to remind everyone that we have our uh, virtual fellowship this Friday at 2.30, at 2.30 on Zoom. So please get in touch with me to get your contact details if we can. Make sure that you join in. Love to have everybody with you. We'll play Boulder Dash one with another. Bible Boulder, that is. And uh, so uh, we're looking forward to 
uh, having everyone together again in a time of fellowship um, this coming Friday. And of course, on Sunday, we're back online again live at 11 a.m. and at half five in the afternoon. So guys, have a wonderful and blessed uh, evening tonight. Get a good night's rest. Have a great rest of your week. If you need anything, please uh, let us know. Also, I want to remind you guys, any prayer requests you have, please send them in through the Facebook uh, prayer, prayer request page. It's called Sarah and Care's Prayer Request or through the WhatsApp group if you're on it. We love you, and we'll see you soon. God bless.